Well, hi. It's my job to explain the uh, HIV diagnosis uh, testing algorithm that was produced in 2014 by the CDC, but it still causes confusion, and I think it's a good time to take a moment to go through the protocol and explain it a little bit. I've chosen some objectives. The first one, really, is to explain what a fourth generation test is. So it sounds like it's the most recent uh, generation test that we have. Uh, other generations, we can, all, we can put those all in a lump as, a, as a, an inferior test that only tests antibodies. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But the key to the new algorithm, then, is, is that we're using a fourth generation, a new kind of test, and it changes how we test patients. The second objective is that we're going to find uh, make sure that everyone knows the three benefits to the new algorithm. The third is that we're going to make sure everybody knows that a second blood draw has to be drawn. A second blood draw has to happen if we either get a positive test or if we get an, uh, a maybe test answer. And I'll explain that. And finally, I want to talk about the very rare instances when we get a negative first test and you still might be worried about HIV happening and what to do about it. So the next slide suggests what the old test and the new test, what difference they have. The old test only, the old test only tested antibodies. That was the very first test that we did. And then the second test that we did after that was another antibody test. And then finally, we'd check for the virus. The new test, this fourth generation test, tests for the virus and the antibody with the first swipe, with the very first blood draw. So I've taken, uh, made symbols of the antibody, showing the, the Y, and then the virus, and then the antibody. Okay, so the, underneath the red box, fourth generation, we, it, it symbolizes that there's both the virus and the antibody. A lot of you may know that the other name for the fourth generation test is antigen antibody. And I want to make sure that that's clear. Antigen is referring to the component of the virus that we're actually measuring in our fourth generation test. And that's the P24 antigen or the capsid antigen. And so you can see that the part of the virus that's the capsid is the, is the center of the virus that holds the nucleic acid in the center. Do I have a? OK, I'm going to move on. So let's go through the three benefits of the fourth generation test. The first one is that we find more acute cases and we find them faster. And that's really important right now. We're finally making headway. If we screen people who are at risk of HIV and capture them early, they transmit less and they get on therapy better, uh, faster and they feel better. And uh, it's, it's a key component, finding the acute cases. The second is that the test is automated at that first test so that you don't need a special doctor to interpret the test. The machine will come out with an answer that is almost always yes or no, and very rarely maybe. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to read that, kind of like a pregnancy test. Usually it's a yes or no. The third is that there are fewer false positives and fewer false negatives. Keep that in mind. So this is the timeline of how the test, the, uh, the, the um, substances in the body are, show up after acute infection. So on the horizontal axis is time in days. And up is the measurement of the different substances. So the blue arrow shows us when the old test would show up positive. 
It's when antibodies were made by the human in response to getting the virus. So it took a while to develop those antibodies. It might take three weeks or four weeks or even four or three months. And you can see that there is a solid line, that third solid line that shows up in, ev in evolution, shows up at a low level and then peaks and then goes up. So antibodies take a while to evolve in the human body in response to being infected. It's not their day one, it might be their day, uh, day 21 or day 28. So we were missing those acute infections that we don't want to miss anymore. The red arrow shows us where the new test is picking up people. And why is it picking it up? Because it's picking up a substance, a part of the virus that it's measuring, the P24 antigen. And when that's showing up, might be more in the range of one to two weeks after acute infection. We'll find the antigen, the test will be positive, and then we can get people linked into care and on therapy. It's a wonderful advance. There would be a third arrow that I would put in, and that is, is when is the virus actually there? I said this fourth generation doesn't measure the virus, it measures a component of the virus. If we measured a viral load, a PCR of the HIV virus, a viral load, we might be able to eke out, find that virus a few days earlier, okay? So maybe two or four days earlier, we might be able to find measurement of the virus. So our test, this fourth generation is very good. It's not perfect yet, but is very good for picking up those early infections. I wanted to mention, without mentioning brand names, that the fourth generation can be called different things. So the CDC mentions fourth generation, but what are they? They can be called HIV antigen antibody combo or HIV antigen antibody or HIV combo antigen antibody EIA. A little bit confusing, but you're seeing that they're talking about antigen and antibody in, the bo in both tests. So we've talked about how important it is when you know a patient, a new patient has a positive test. What kind of test was done is a really important question. You're gonna look for your lab when you call them. You're going to look to make sure that those two words are there, antigen, antibody in the name. I wanted to mention a little bit about that need for the second test. So as we go through the algorithm, we, ha we can say, well, what does that first test, that fourth generation, what information does it give us in that first blood draw? And you can see in this chart that you could have, with that very first draw, uh, blood draw, a pretty solid no as your answer. No, this patient doesn't have HIV. So over on the far left is if the, if the test comes back negative, they didn't, that test did not find antigen or antibody or both. And that answer was a no, that was negative. And that's where you could stop. Most of the time you can stop there. If it's positive, it tells you once again, whether there's antigen, antibody, or both. And so then you have to do some more testing. But guess what? The same sample is tested a second time. And this time it differentiates between HIV-1, which is the common dominant form in our whole world, but particularly in the United States, and HIV-2, which is pretty rare and usually geographically located outside of the United States, okay? But some people move around our world, so we need to test for both. So the second test that happens within that first blood draw from that same sample is gonna be able to decide, is there HIV-1? Is there HIV-2 or is there both HIV-1 and HIV-2, okay? Now, there's a fourth answer, a fourth column, and that is the first swipe of that test, that first process was positive, but the second process, when it looked for HIV-1 or HIV-2, uh, 
it came back negative or it came back not really sure, okay? In that case, another test has to be done and it has to be a second blood draw. But in the real world, we're always, unless there's an absolute no, we're always doing another blood draw. We wanna know what that viral load is. We wanna know what that CD4 count is. So what I say is once you get any kind of any answer besides absolute no, you need another blood draw and what test you need is a viral load test. I'm gonna point out in this, this diagram, they don't say viral load though, just to confuse you. They say NAT, N-A-T, nucleic acid test. They're pretty much the same thing. We can think about them in the same way. But when you come down to ordering your test, you're gonna say HIV viral load or HIV PCR quantitative, okay? Just to remind you, for that first process in the test, we're checking for antibody as well as the virus. And then the second process within that same blood draw, same test, or same um, uh, episode of blood testing, we're checking for an antibody. So we're doing that second swipe to decide whether somebody has antibodies to HIV-1 or HIV-2. Well, guess what? There are some people who are acutely becoming infected. They've, got, they've gotten infection, but they haven't made antibodies. Guess what category they would show up in? They would show up in the no, they don't have HIV-1 or HIV-2 because it's testing for antibodies, right? They haven't made their antibodies yet because they're acutely getting infected. They're acutely, they're gonna be producing antibodies, but they don't have it yet. So that, pa that patient population who gets a, a, a um, uh, yes, they have a fourth generation positive test, but they c the machine can't decide whether it's HIV one or two. Those are the people we're really, really super duper concerned about for acute infection, particularly in our pregnant women where we have to worry about the baby and the mom. This slide just reminds me to tell you about the NAT. The NAT really is the viral load. That's the test that we would need. In this case, after we get to um, that HIV-1 neg HIV HIV negative or indeterminate, you need that second blood draw to be able to decide that yes, they have measurable virus. They have the P24, I'm sorry, the viral load is positive. And then, or no, it's a false positive fourth generation assay, okay? False positive test. We couldn't find virus. We couldn't find antibody to HIV-1, and yet that first test was positive. So that's gonna be an error within the test, most likely. So the next objective, actually we've really talked about, know that a second blood draw is absolutely necessary to define what's going on with this patient if the fourth generation test is positive. The red arrow reminds me, second blood draw. All the pictures of the virus remind me that anytime you have any test result besides absolutely negative in your first, that first fourth generation test, right? You're gonna to wanna to know what that viral load is. So that's what you order all across the board. Finally, we need to know what that window period is, the HIV window period. And then we need to know how to personalize the testing schedule for that pregnant woman who has a negative fourth generation, but you're really worried about this patient. And we think this is fairly rare, but it could happen. So the window is the number of days between getting the infection to being able to detect the infection. So way back when, it might have been as long as 
three months before we could find everybody with antibodies to HIV. That was a really long time, old test. The fourth generation, a typical window where maybe the test isn't positive, it might be 10 days or two weeks post-infection. It might go all the way out to four weeks, but by, 90, by 12, week 12, 99.9% .9 of patients are positive. So we're talking about those people who might, they might, they, they've just got such high risk or they're appearing like they have acute retroviral syndrome and you're really worried about that. That's when you're gonna be saying, you know, I can't say no ne that the negative result to the fourth generation should be done, that that should be where should you end your workup. Remember I said another way maybe to catch people even earlier than the fourth generation is to get a viral load test. So let's keep that in our back pocket that we might say, even if there's a negative fourth generation, I might wanna check a viral load right then and there. So, for a pregnant woman at high risk of seroconversion with a negative fourth generation test, we need to design a repeat testing strategy. So, the earliest retest that, we, that kind of makes logical test, the testing strategy, like logical sense, might be four weeks. That's a really long time when you're really wanting to start therapy as soon as you know somebody has HIV. But by the reading, that's what they're saying. I think in reality, we might test thing, people faster than that. We are now saying that for somebody who has higher than expected risk, we would want a third, a third trimester test it, testing. And in fact, in Illinois, we're saying, let's test everyone. Let's be really aggressive and test everyone at third trimester. Routinely, that might happen on the earlier side of third trimester, so at 28 weeks or so when we're doing other routine testing. Okay. But I want to mention on this video that we might need to personalize repeat testing and we might need to do a viral load every once in a while as, along with a fourth generation. In this special situation where somebody's at incredible high risk, a known partner with uh, uh, HIV that is not on therapy, um, that we might want to do that toward delivery, closer toward delivery. Or um, someone, a woman who's pregnant who comes in with fevers and a rash and swollen lymph nodes and a sore throat we might want to do a viral load test at that time as well as a fourth generation test because we're think of thinking that this might be acute retroviral syndrome. So let's conclude. The fourth generation is really the foundation, the fourth, fourth generation test is the real foundation of the new updated algorithm. It's really good at identifying acute infections it does it cheaper, faster, and better, but it's not perfect. We all need to know and push with our colleagues that a second blood draw needs to be, draw, um, needs to be performed for that viral load measurement. If there's any answer on the fourth generation test other than absolute negative. For the pregnant woman sick with possible acute retroviral syndrome, a fourth, if a fourth generation test is negative, get a viral load. And for asymptomatic pregnant women at risk of HIV, acute HIV infection, and if that test is negative, um, consider doing further testing, including a viral load. I'll end there.